So we know that with the 11th overall pick, the Vancouver Canucks made a selection that I pretty much am on board with now. After thinking about it a bit more, processing who was available and what this player that they took ended up meaning, sure, while Tom Villander may not have been the BPA, I had Zach Benson up there, I can't really say I'm upset with the pick. I like it a lot. But... Let's head over on to the recent episode of Sakaris and Price and talk about a Cam Robinson segment highlighting whom the Canucks could have drafted instead had the draft order above them gone a little bit differently. Take a look at this one minute and three second clip on Sakaris and Price. It'll be linked in the description if you want to go ahead and listen to it yourself. But what they did was they had Cam Robinson, EP guy, director of scouting, I'm pretty sure that's what he is for Elite Prospects, director of film scouting, excuse me. He went out there and had a segment as to who he was hearing was sort of in the mix for the Canucks 11th overall pick. And the quote here kind of says it all. I had heard all week here in Nashville that it was going to be Villander or Danielson unless Dalibor Dvorsky slipped. And he almost slipped. And so, from the wording of this quote over here, it's apparent that the Vancouver Canucks had a list that sort of went as follows for whom they would have wanted the most at 11. Dvorsky, Danielson, and then maybe a combination of Villander and or Simishev. Robinson actually says in the clip that he didn't really hear too much Canucks steam on Simishev, more so than Villander, and the assumption is maybe if both defensemen had been available, they would have taken Villander over Simishev, which, I mean, I can understand why if Villander is a right-handed guy, Simishev is a left-handed guy, that argument makes sense, although I'd argue that the talent level and ceiling of Simishev may be just a tad higher than what Villander could be capable of at his best-case scenario. But the wording of the quote and the way it's phrased in the video kind of implies that had the Vancouver Canucks had the option of drafting one of the two centers that went 9th and 10th overall, Nate Danielson with Detroit and Dalibor Dvorsky at 10, the Canucks might have taken these guys instead. And I've gone over this diatribe before. When it comes to these two names, I was very conflicted as to whether or not the Vancouver Canucks should have seen the most value out of them. Let's head over onto the Red Wings and their ninth overall pick, Nate Danielson, and just go over my thoughts because when it comes to this player, I've made it very clear that I don't really think his ceiling is all too high. A lot of the draft consensus we have seen out of Danielson is that this is a really solid two-way guy who can play PK, he can score some points, but at the NHL level, he may only max out as a third line, borderline second line center. And it's odd because there seems to be a lot of consensus amongst the scouting community that Danielson may not necessarily ever be a top-line player. Sure, he is that in the WHL, but his ceiling, his offensive IQ, his potential doesn't really bode well for projecting long-term first-line success at this level. And if he does become a first-line center, then okay, I'm going to eat my hat. I'm going to say that I'm wrong here. But when it comes to this player, he was a lot more of a high-floor, low-ceiling type of pick. And so, if the Vancouver Canucks had the option of taking Danielson over a guy like Villander, my question would have been why? The Vancouver Canucks have made it very clear that they want to draft based off of best player available, and I mean, every team goes out there and says the same thing, but for Vancouver in particular, if you're looking for a guy who could help out your team long term because you want to be able to remain competitive, Nate Danielson may not necessarily be shooting for the stars and the moon here. In fact, I feel like it would be drafting for need even more so than the Villander pick, mostly because, if you think about it, the Vancouver Canucks long-term have two centers already in Miller and Petey. If you draft Danielson, you're almost indirectly saying, yeah, we're drafting this guy because we need a third-line center in particular. And it's an odd mindset because third-line guys are normally available in free agency or trade. Sure, they cost a pretty penny most of the time, especially if you're trading for somebody at the trade deadline, for example. Any third-line center going at the deadline, if you're a contender team, usually costs an arm and a leg. But the fact is, they are available. And using one of your top 15 draft spots on someone that you're projecting to be that... It doesn't really make too much sense in my mind, logistically speaking. Like, Nate Danielson was supposed to go a lot later in a lot of these drafts for a reason. No, I'm not going to go out there and straight up deny or doubt the Iser plan, but I've made it very clear this entire time that I really do feel like Nate Danielson might not have been the best pick at ninth overall. 
Either way, though, he went there, and the Vancouver Canucks did not have the opportunity to draft him, and the same could be said about the 10th overall pick St. Louis Blues forward Dalibor Dvorsky. And the reason Dvorsky is an interesting one is because this guy was compared mostly to Mikhail Backlund the entire season. And if you know Mikhail Backlund, you know he's not a top-line center either. He's a two-way guy, very strong on the puck, very capable defensively on the penalty kill, but he's a top-six center, maybe even a third-line center on an amazing team. And for Dalibor Dvorsky, that projection wasn't really somebody that screamed to me, oh yeah, top player, top-line center pick available in this year's draft. And you could say a lot of the same things about Danielson with the analysis of Dvorsky, although in my opinion, I do think that Dvorsky has a higher ceiling, partly due to his performance at the World Under-18s. Dvorsky popped off at that tournament, and that's sort of when Craig Button started to change his narrative on what Dvorsky could be. He turned from Mikhail Backlund into more so of a Bo Horvat conversation. And Horvat is a guy who went ninth overall in his draft in 2013. He was a 60-goal caliber center for a good chunk of this past year before getting traded over to the New York Islanders, and then he got a huge contract signed to $8.5 million a year. Horvat is a... Oh boy, do I want to say he's a first-line center? I feel like if you played Bo Horvat as a first-line center, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, as long as you had other players who were of the same talent caliber as Horvat mixed in throughout your lineup. You can't just have Bo Horvat as your number one guy. You need an Elias Pettersson, and you need a JT Miller around him. Horvat was able to succeed pretty well, and he produced like crazy for Vancouver, especially towards the end of his tenure here. 31 goals, 49 assists. Now, I don't necessarily see Dalibor Dvorsky scoring goals at that pace, but the ceiling is nice to see. However, the same argument applies here with Dalibor Dvorsky potentially being the Canucks pick. If you're drafting Dvorsky, you're essentially drafting a third-line center because in a perfect world, you're not getting this guy to play first-line minutes on your team when Elias Pettersson is there. Same thing could be said about Miller. So, if Dvorsky pans out, you're really just drafting a third-line center who is probably going to demand too much money by the time he is in his prime. It's going to be messy because if you sign PD to a long-term deal, Miller's going to be in a long-term deal. It's going to be the same problem all over again when you realize, oh yeah, Bo Horvat needed a contract, and if you wanted to shell out $8 million to a guy like Horvat, you would have been paying $8 million to a center being used on the third line, and that doesn't really make too much sense. Sure, these guys are talented, but at some point you gotta acknowledge where your team is at. And it's why 11th overall is such an interesting pick, because at that range, past the top 10 and into the mid-teens, that's when I sort of feel it's more appropriate to draft for need than anything else. I was okay with the idea of the Canucks taking Zach Benson, because even as a winger, there's more versatility there. And long term, you can't really go out there and expect the team to roll with the winger core that they have. Besser, Garland, Bavillier, Pearson, all these guys have been in trade rumors the past little while, so it's not guaranteed that any of them are going to stick around. For Miller and Petey, though, these guys are going to be here, which is why the center idea doesn't really make the most sense to me when you think about it as an evaluation of whom the Canucks should have used their pick on. As for Villander, the fact that he's got maybe a top three ceiling in the NHL as a defender on a team as a shutdown guy with physical tools and an offensive game that's yet to explode, the fact that Craig Button labeled this guy as a top two pairing defenseman, I think that's pretty all right for a guy at 11, especially when you take a look at what the Canucks need. They needed a right-handed defenseman for the long-term future. Hronik, sure, he's there, but is he a number one? Is he going to play with Hughes? Probably not. The stylistic compatibility just isn't really there. So for Villander to have been drafted at that spot as the next Canucks right-handed defenseman to play with Hughes, as a guy who already had a good enough ceiling to justify being taken in this range anyway, I feel like that's all right. And I know Villander has the naysayers, oh, this guy was ranked to go a lot later, what are you talking about? It's the same thing with Nate Danielson. I really feel like the opposite perspective had been true here with Villander, wherein his performance at the World Under-18s really boosted up his stock, and he had a lot of people sort of changing their minds on him. If anything, the evaluations on Villander kind of mirror Dalibor Dvorsky instead, although Dvorsky was seen as a top pick for the entirety of the draft, Villander was not. And so, when it comes to this Cam Robinson clip about how the Canucks probably would have drafted one of Danielson or Dvorsky had they both been available instead of Villander, I'm kind of thankful that Stevie Y and the Blues ended up taking these two guys at 9th and 10th overall, respectively. 
So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Do you agree with my assessment over here? Do you think it was the best pick they could have made? Aside from, of course, maybe Zach Benson or Oliver Moore, one of the other wingers that was available instead. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm Charles 99. And bye.